So thank you very much for what was, I'm sure, an absolutely magnificent introduction of me. And I decided that in order to avoid embarrassment, I shouldn't actually understand precisely what you said, but I, I got the gist. And I think you covered far too much of my far too long career by now. In normal circumstances, I would have retired at least 12 years ago. Uh, it's an enormous honor and pleasure to be here uh, again. And I have to say, I am in what might well be the most beautiful auditorium I've ever spoken in. And I have spoken in many, so congratulations on what you have achieved here. Um, it is also a great pleasure to be here on the occasion of the publication of my book in Spanish. Um, I think, uh, well, certainly my recent books have been translated into Spanish, and the interests of the Spanish public, or at least the publisher, hopeful in the hoping for the interests of the Spanish public, uh, has been very encouraging to me. Not all continental countries have been equally enthusiastic about my work. So I am very proud uh, of, the, uh, of that. And by the way, as far as I can see, the edition itself is incredibly beautiful and beautifully done. I have, however, spent five hours this, no, six hours this morning in an intense breakfast meeting and also in discussing my book with journalists and broadcasters. So if I come across a bit tired by now, it's all the fault of my host. <laughs> what I'm going to do is something I don't normally do, but I was asked to provide a lecture so this is going to be a proper lecture. And I think it will take about 35 minutes or so. But I think it will give you an overview of uh, uh, the, what this book is about. This does not mean that you don't have to read it, because there is a great deal of material in the book which I think is of value. Uh, and some of the charts, e even say something useful about Spain, and one of them I'm going to show tonight. I hope if the technology all works. Let me start, if I may, um, with a quotation. I'm going to read the quotation. I will not tell you now whose words these are. I found them in the course of my a research, which was a long lot of research since I was going into areas of politics and political history with which I was not too familiar. But it is an author I knew from my years at Oxford, because when I went up, though I ended up indeed doing politics and philosophy and economics, I spent two years doing nothing but classical languages. And that's, I would say even now, that is the most important part of my education by far. And later on, I did a graduate degree in economics just to prove I could do it properly. Anyway, the quotation is, it is clear then that the best partnership in a state is that the one which operates through the middle people by which the author meant the middle classes. And also that those states in which the middle classes are large and stronger, if possible, than the other two together, by which he meant the rich and the impoverished, or at any rate stronger than either of them alone, have every chance of having a well-run democratic constitution. And this, in a sense, is a core part of my argument. And this quotation to my astonishment, comes from Aristotle. So, who was, of course, the first proper political scientist, and his book, The Politics, is one of the two foundational texts of political theory with Plato's Republic, which is also to be found at considerable length in my book. <laughs> 
And the second quote I use, but I don't think I have it here, is also a Greek text. It's Mervanagan, which is to be found in the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, and it means nothing in excess. The basic argument being, which is the core argument of my book, that a sophisticated, civilized society is a complex balance of potentially conflicting elements. And that's an absolutely fundamental point. And the great mistake of those on the far left and right is to b believe that this can be simplified down to one thing and one thing alone. In 1937, this is why I wrote this book, this part, my father left Vienna for England on his own. His immediate family, that his brother, sister, parents, and one of his, bro and his brother's child, managed by a miracle to escape to Palestine in 1939. But their wider family was stuck in Poland and apart from one young woman whom I got to know very well and died recently, nearly 100, they all perished in the Holocaust. In May 1940, my mother's father, a self-made Jewish fish merchant born in poverty in Amsterdam, managed to hijack a trawler in order to take his family to England as the German armies poured across the Dutch frontier. He was one of nine. He asked his brothers and sisters to join him with their families. None of them came. They all thought they would be perfectly safe. Their families also, without exception, perished in the Holocaust. I'm not certain of the numbers, but essentially all my parents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, somewhere between 40 and 50 men, women, and children were exterminated. And this catastrophe was, of course, the result of the collapse of civilization in the early 20th century in Europe. There were many reasons for this collapse, but significant among them, as I explain in my book, was an economic catastrophe, the Great Depression. Hitler was brought to power in the end by the Great Depression. And my conclusion then, when I started to study economics, and now, is that if people cannot gain what they feel is a decent standard of living, a hope of reasonable prosperity, a peaceful and stable democratic order based on consent becomes hard, if not impossible, to sustain. And that is why the theme of this book, which I began as Donald Trump became President of the United States in 2016, and the lies of the Brexit campaign also transferred, transformed my country, seized me then and seizes me now. I am, to be absolutely clear, not saying that what happened then will happen again. I am saying that one must never assume the stability of a civilized democracy, not even the most powerful, not even the United States. And let me then talk about what my friend, now friend, I didn't know him before I started this work, Larry Diamond, professor at Stanford and the Hoover Institution, and the world's most distinguished student of democracy, calls the democratic recession which is what is going on now. In a liberal democracy, a democracy characterized then by individual civil rights, the rule of law, and respect for both the rights of the losers and the legitimacy of the winners, fair elections, free and fair elections, determine who holds power. Without that, 
it cannot possibly be a democracy. Evidently, attempts by any head of government and state to subvert the election or overturn the vote are treason to the constitutional order. Yet that is exactly what Donald Trump attempted to do before and after the last presidential elections. He failed. Decent and brave people ensured that. But to this day, despite those, the, the, the relatively poor performance of the Republican Party in the midterms, Trump, day by day, continues to hold the loyalty of his party's base, and whether forced or not, also of nearly all the current presidential candidates. Meanwhile, devoutly conservative, arch-conservative stalwarts, such as Liz Cheney, daughter of Vice President Dick Cheney, than whom a more conservative person could hardly be imagined, was thrown out of Congress. And her crime? Stating that Trump's big lie, that the outcome of the election was a lie, is a big lie. And as you know, more recently, many of the people who supported him in his campaign, arguing that it was a big lie, have now turned state's evidence in terror of the lengthy jail terms they face. And indeed, we are confronted with the possibility that Donald Trump will be president and in prison, or president instead of being in prison. The Republican Party, then, one of the two main parties in the world's most important democracy, is simply no longer committed to the most fundamental of all democratic norms, fair and free elections. Yet how can a democracy survive if people think the only thing that matters is winning? Democracy is essentially grounded in moral values, ethics. We all have to think of ourselves as citizens. We govern through debate, not force. And we argue at least reasonably honestly. With those values gone, what is left but violence? Trump is, alas, not alone. Freedom in the World 2023, from the independent US watchdog Freedom House, published every February, has reported an 18th consecutive year of decline in the global health of liberal democracy. The democratic recession that I have talked about um, might soon be close to a democratic depression. This decline has occurred in all regions of the world, very much so in the fragile democracies that emerged after the Cold War. But most significantly, it is also observable, observable in core Western democracies, above all, including the US, the most important of them all, indeed the, the country that beyond doubt saved democracy in the 20th century. So that's where we are. Now let me go back into the past to discuss at least briefly how this strange combination of democracy with the market was born. According to one of the better known databases on politics, 200 years ago, well more precisely in 1800, there were no democracies in the world, no countries in which there was sufficient number of people who were electors and a sufficiently genuine electoral process to describe the, the system as democratic. In the US, for example, though it was a republic, approximately 6% of adults alone had the vote. Even where Republican institutions did exist, 
the franchise was highly restricted, as I've just said, on the grounds of sex, race, and wealth. Then in the 19th century, franchises were widened and universal suffrage democracy began to emerge and spread in fits and starts to cover half the world's countries after 1990, before their more recent decline. This did not happen everywhere, and it certainly did not include some of the world's most important countries, consider China, for example. But it happened in enough countries to change the world. Let me just give you a, I hope this will work. Oh, I did have Med and Agana, I forgot that. So this, briefly, is the story of the spread of democracy over the last 150 years. It starts in 1870. The brown line, which can be seen on the, whose scale is on the right-hand side, shows the proportion of the world's independent countries. Remember, the number has changed over time. I, it's discussed in the book, but I can't discuss it now, that we could be regarded as democratic. By 1870, that was 10%. By the beginning of the 20th century, well, by just after the First World War, actually, it was 40%. It collapsed in the era of communism and fascism to just over 10%. There was a big jump then as um, the, uh, Europe was freed uh, with the fall of, of, um, of Nazism and fascism in Italy. And then it was stable until 1980, 19, basically 1980, and then it exploded after, up, up, upwards after the fall of the Soviet Union. The other lines in this chart, the blue one and the orange one, which can be read on the left-hand scale, basically are of very simple measures of the openness of the world economy, what you might call a simple measure of the global market economy with the ratio of world trade to GDP. And this it correlates quite remarkably closely, I was really surprised when I did it, with the spread of democracy. It's a very simple way, naive way, I accept, of indicating that there is some connection, but which I'll come to in greater detail in a moment, between democratization and the dynamism and confidence in the world that a liberal economy shows. So let's go back into this history and ask, why was there this general acceptance, to a degree that had never happened before in the world, of dem democratic principles? It's important to remember, it can't be difficult to understand here, that the historically normal way to structure econo economies and politics of societies which are agrarian or post-agrarian has been for power to marry wealth and wealth to marry power. In other words, quite simply, the most powerful people in society were the richest and vice versa. And of course, absolute monarchs, and the more absolute they were, the truer this was, effectively owned everything. So why did this revolutionary change towards democracy occur slowly in the 19th century and to a greater degree in the 20th? The answer, I argue, lies with the emergence of a marriage between two very different partners, a liberal economy and a democratic polity. Market capitalism and democracy are, I argue, complementary opposites. That's the complexity I talked of earlier. The market economy and universal suffrage democracy both reject the role of ascribed hereditary status. Ascribed hereditary status. They also embrace the idea that people are entitled to decide important things in economics and in politics for themselves. Market capitalism rests on ideals of free labor, individual effort, reward for merit, and of course, based on the rule of law. 
democracy rests on ideals of free discussion and debate among the citizens when making those laws. Historically, the market economy also brought slowly, with difficulty and with much pain and conflict, urbanization, a growing demand for an educated workforce and so widening education, the newly organized working class, very different from the peasants of old, and opportunities for a positive sum form of politics because economies began to grow. Democracies rest, as Aristotle said, on the existence of an economically independent citizenry. That is partly why this economic progress turned out to be so important. A fully socialist society, one in which the state essentially owns everything, is inevitably a dictatorship since the ownership of productive assets is vested entirely in those who control the state. In the absence of coordination through competitive markets, the state is then responsible for the allocation of those valuable resources. It simply has too much power. Markets protect democratic politics from such an excessive concentration of power, but democratic politics, I argue, also protect markets from an excessive concentration of wealth. And we saw this very definitely in the earlier to mid part of the 20th century. And these then are the ways in which the market economy and liberal democracy are complementary. But they are also opposites. Capitalism, the market economy, tends to be global. It's cosmopolitan. A democratic state is by definition territorial. The market is the domain of exit and individual choice. Democracy is the domain of voice and collective choice. The market economy is quite ten prone quite easily to become inegalitarian, one dollar, one vote, while democracy is inherently, and at least in theory, egalitarian, one person, one vote. So tensions between capitalism and democracy are going to emerge. And I argue, if the economy fails to serve the interests of the majority, the sense of shared citizenship will fray and we will see populist demagogues emerging. Populism in itself, which by which I mean simply anti-elitism in politics, is not necessarily lethal for democracy so long as it takes the form of a justified hostility to predatory elites. But too often, as Jens Werner Müller of Princeton argues, it transforms into hostility to pluralism, and pluralism is an essential element in democracy. When this happens, democracy is transformed into plebiscitary dictatorship and ultimately a dictatorship. Alternatively, at the opposite point, from the opposite side, the concentration of wealth occurring in the economy can lead to plutocracy as wealth is once again transmuted back into power. And a lot of that is happening in our countries and particularly, I think, in the US. Indeed, it is quite likely for there to be a predatory autocracy and a corrupt, corrupt plutocracy in uneasy tension. That was essentially the governing system of the Roman um, Empire. In some, democracy and the market are married to each other, but like many marriages, it's a pretty difficult one. Now let me turn to the current state of democracy in the high-income countries. Large rises in inequality and the deteriorating prospects of the old respectable working and middle classes in core democracies have been eroding the foundations of and the confidence in democracy. The fear of downward mobility has, I argue, created status anxiety and widespread cynicism. These have then been diverted by skilled right-wing propagandists and, and demagogues into cultural and racial resentments, the more so in ethnically diverse society. This is not new 
was long the foundation of the political culture of the American South. And of course, this similarly played a big role in the foundations of European fascism. These resentments have, in my view, been aggravated by the emergence of a large and discontented class of university educated clerics, clerics dedicated to a progressive cultural and racial politics. And tragically, this identity the army of the left has clashed with and motivates the silent majority army of the right um, to create a profound cultural split in society. And in cultural splits of this kind have become the dominant feature of the politics in quite a number of countries. The emergence of the new media have facilitate, facilitated these trends, but in my view, I discussed this, they have not created them. So a big question is what has happened to create what I call status anxiety, particularly in people who did not go into college. In, long, in the long run, I argue, many of the crucial phenomena have been economic, deindustrialization, rising inequality, and collapsing growth. Let me just show one chart. This is my chart on deindustrialization. There are very few charts, but I've taken a small handful. These charts shows the share of industry in employment um, ranked by the decline in the shares between 1970 and 2019, so basically over half a century. The blue bar, which is negative, shows how big the percentage point decline is. So to take the most extreme case, the UK, the proportion of people working in industry over half a century has fallen from it by 25 percentage points, nearly 20, sorry, just over, yes, just over 25 percentage points from 40 to uh, about 12. A staggering economic shift. There's pretty big decline for Spain, as you can see, roughly in the middle. And uh, there's also, surprisingly, a very big decline for Germany, from, but from an exceptionally high level. I will go into, won't go into that, but that has much to do with the reaction to the Hartz reforms. An intriguing fact is that US and UK are the most unequal of the big high-income countries, and they have, in the last eight years, suffered some of the most potent right-wing populist politics, in our case, Brexit, in other case, Trump's. Is that an accident? I doubt it. In addition, and I think this will be very um, startling, this is what has happened to the decade by decade average growth rate of output per hour in the major developed countries. So it starts with the 50s and ends up with the 2010s. And you will see there pretty clearly a dramatic deterioration in productivity growth, the main determinant of prosperity in all these countries over this period, and particularly those of the most successful in the earlier period, namely the continental Europeans. Britain is now down there near the bottom with Italy. My friend Raghuram Rajan argued in a brilliant book just published just before the financial crisis that easy credit long papered over these adverse trends. But that easy credit blew up completely in the, the next huge event, the financial crisis. In my view, the scale and visibility of that crisis and the rescue of the banks and bankers convinced many, many people that the elites running our society were not just incompetent, but corrupt. And the post-financial crisis period has been quite dramatic. And I think this chart might particularly uh, uh, be a particular interest to you. I think it's the last chart I have. The chart is a little complex, but not that complex. What it shows is the proportional deviation of GDP per head, the most simple measure of prosperity, over the, the period from 2007 to 2021, which is the last time, 
date I had when I published my book, um, from the pre-crisis trend. And the pre-crisis trend was 1990 to 2007. And the green line at the bottom is Spain. And by 2021, GDP per head in Spain was 33% lower than it would have been if the pre-financial crisis trend had continued. By the way, the UK isn't much better, and the other country that is close to Spain is, of course, Italy. It is not surprising, perhaps, that the country that suffered the least decline, the one at the top, is Germany, which survived the financial crisis relatively well. So we have experienced in the last 15 years a dramatic shift into income stagnation in many of our countries. And it was because of this that in the US, say, and the US is pretty badly affected in there, it's down about 20%. That is why this and the financial rescue, why the Republican establishment became so ripe for a populist takeover. But basically, it discredited the establishment in both parties. And by the way, in my view, it particularly discredited conventional conservatives. The shift towards skill-intensive sectors, technology, and deindustrialization of the labor force, which I've mentioned, globalization, and the rise of China, all factors were the product of powerful underlying economic forces. Yet there is, and I argue this at length, also substantial evidence of the emergence of a form of rentier capitalism with declining competition, rising monopoly, and unbridled self-seeking by corporate executives. Furthermore, the role of money in politics, especially in the US, has eroded both the tax base and the effectiveness of regulation. It's not surprising people are cynical about conventional politics. So now let me turn, basically at the end, to where we are with democratic capitalism today. Branko Milanovic, a great uh, analyst of inequality and former uh, um, economist at the World Bank, I know very well, argues that capitalism is alone. There's no question about the survival of capitalism, he argues, or at least some form of capitalism. Yet what sort of capitalism has it, is it that has won? Is it what Milanovic calls liberal capitalism and I call dem democratic capitalism? Or is it what he calls political capitalism and I call authoritarian capitalism? And in fact, I go further and argue that there are now two forms of authoritarian capitalism in the world. The most common, but possibly the least dangerous in the global sense, derives from a hostile takeover of democracies from within. The would-be autocrat eats out democracy. Usually he, or maybe also occasionally a she, starts as a populist demagogue. And features of such regimes include a very narrow circle of trusted servants, promotion of members of the family, and people who operate the power ministries the police, the justice ministry, and so forth, who are personally loyal to the leader rather than to the state. Plutocrats often find it necessary to support the gangster in charge. Ultimately, however, even they survive only as cronies. The other challenger is what I call bureaucratic capitalism, the Chinese system, a communist bureaucracy operating a capitalist economy can be self-disciplined, long-sighted, technocratic, and rational. Even so, bureaucratic capitalism also suffers from the vices of authoritarianism, especially the tendency towards corruption and crony capitalism. These failings damage both the economy and political legitimacy, and I actually wrote about these in the case of China in my column today. Bureaucratic capitalism is a significant challenger to the Western democratic version. Yet, it is also true that autocracies are and remain bad systems. They do not have a structure of accountability. They cannot have open debate. 
They cannot ensure the peaceful transfer of power, and they tend towards unbridled cronyism and corruption. Indeed, corruption too often becomes the system. And we should remember that liberal democracy has come through many challenges over the past century. I believe it is still the best system. It rests on the magnificent belief in the rights of the people to make up their own minds and lead lives they choose within societies whose joint decisions are taken with the active consent of the government. So the challenge is to renew democratic capitalism. And the renewal must, in my view, be animated by a simple but powerful idea, that of shared citizenship. If democracy is to work, we cannot think of ourselves only as consumers, workers, business owners, savers or investors. We must also think of ourselves as citizens. And citizenship must have three aspects loyalty to democratic, political, and legal institutions, and the values of open debate and mutual tolerance that underpin them, concern for the ability of fellow citizens to live a fulfilled life, and the desire to create an economy that allows all citizens hope of a better future. The world has changed too profoundly for nostalgia for the past to be a reasonable response. We cannot go back to what we were 70 years ago. Yet some things remain the same. As human beings, we must always act collectively as well as individually. That is what it means to be a social animal. Acting together within a democracy, as I stated, means acting and thinking as citizens. And if we do not think in that way, democracy will fail. If our overriding loyalties are not to the society as a whole, but to a, a subset, democracy will fail. The UK had Boris Johnson and then Liz Trust as prime ministers in succession. One was a fraud, the other was a fanatic. But we, and this is the good story, both were got rid of peacefully. Nobody died. Nobody was shot. They were got rid of peacefully. Contrast this for a moment with the likely fate of Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping. Both are dictators and both, in my view, have proved themselves to be manifestly incompetent and malevolent. And is there any way to ensure that autocrats will be decent, self-restrained people? There is no way. Is there any way to get rid of them? None, short of violence. And that is the difference. It is the difference between rule by consent and rule by co coercion. It is our duty, all of our duties, to ensure that the long struggle that I described earlier to create democracies does not fail. Thank you for listening.